Usually I only talk to about 30 people and it's a little more close. This is a lot of folks, so welcome. Um, I'm going to do somewhat of an um, advertisement. I just did a book. I get nothing from these books. The French Creek, French and Pickering Creek, and Hopewell Friends published them. But they're doing a big deal in Warwick. They found four revolutionary cannons there. And if you haven't been over to Warwick Ruins, it's worth going over and seeing the cannon. It's a sister. Has anybody seen the Kaufman Cannon, the Ole Cannon? The cannons are the sisters of that. They're, they were dug at the same time. So I'm going to pass two books around. And if whoever please at the end, take them and, and return them because they're mine. But and it's dark, so you probably can't see much anyhow. But anyhow, there's uh, they just uh, put the uh, cannon in a building, and they're having their grand opening on the 14th. So you can get the book from Mastoff. I think it's $14 Mastoff in Oregon Town. Yeah. If I had good eyes, I could probably see in the dark, but I don't. Um, let me try it. Okay, again, my name is Dan Graham. I've been doing iron, thank you. I've been doing iron research for a, a lot of years. Uh, in 1974, I was married to a Westchester woman, and they were having a, um, a bridal shower for her. And um, the men were kicked out because they weren't allowed to go to bridal showers in the 70s. And um, my uh, wife's grandfather's cousin said, come on, I'm going to take you over and show you what we used to own. Uh, and he, my wife's related to the owners of Warwick Furnace way back in, you know, seven, eight generations back. So I got to climb on Warwick Ruins, and I was kind of... Uh, uh, got into it and have stayed into it. Um, what I'm going to try to talk about today is the Pennsylvania iron industry. So when you leave here, you're going to understand what a furnace is, what a for, uh, forge is, what the difference is, what a bloomery is, and then I'll get into a little bit on how that applies to the Ole Valley. Um, I do a four-hour course uh, two-day course, two hours and two hours, so you're going to get an abbreviated uh, version of that. Um, when I talked to Tom about doing this, uh, we talked about, I said I wasn't quite sure what the boundaries of the Ole Valley were, and I said, well, well let's go to Pendleton and we'll use whatever Phil Pendleton said, um, we'll use that as the boundaries. And we found five ironworks within the boundaries of what he considered to be Ole. So uh, we'll discuss those briefly. Um, in my um, years of doing this, I have five observations about the Pennsylvania, or the colonial iron industry. Um, one, it's very hard to say, compare what happens in it. Um, it was 60 years long, 1716, was Thomas Rudder. Tom mentioned him. He discovered the first, he built the first iron work down in Pine Forge. Uh, and it ended, I guess, in 1776. But if you think about the airplane industry, how they had biplanes in 18, 17, 18, 1918 and jets in 1960, the iron industry in Pennsylvania did the same thing. It changed. And you're going to be in places where somebody will say, this is how it is. And that was how it is at that point in time, at that place, because it differed a little bit. Um, cost didn't change much. I'm always amazed. Some poor guy digging iron in 1720, his great-grandson was making about the same amount in uh, 1780. Uh, it's not like today where the prices keep going up, going up, and going. There were spikes, but... But there wasn't a whole lot of change in, in, in what they were paying folks. Um, I discovered that sort of the old iron industry that we had here was not an ecological uh, friendly um, industry. They dumped anything they could in the streams. They didn't think anything about it. Um, they pretty much had to be medically all deaf. Uh, I do a lot of chainsaw work. My wife's always told me I'm deaf. I probably am. But when we get into, when I mentioned a refinery forge that did this much louder than I'm doing for 
24-7 and your ears next to it. I can't believe those guys could hear after age 30. Um, I was in the artillery in the Army, and the 30-year-old guys, the old guys, had what we call artillery ears, which meant they couldn't hear anything. Uh, finally, um, they died early. It's, it's amazing, the Iron Masters, whatever they were sniffing from the fumes of the iron they were smelting could not have been good for them because they, they all fairly died young. All right, um, how did Pennsylvania's iron industry start? Um, Pennsylvania was settled late by Europeans. It was one of the last colonies settled. Uh, William Penn came over. He wanted to develop, develop the iron resources here. He tried to do that. Nothing happened. Um, at that time, the colonies and Pennsylvania were getting their iron from England, who got their pig iron from Sweden. And I'll discuss the, di the difference in that in a minute. Swedish pig iron went to England, who refined it and sent it to the colonies. So the colonies were getting wrought iron, which they needed, which the blacksmiths needed, from Sweden, in effect, but through England. Um, and Queen Anne died in 1714, and who cares about that? Um, Parliament had passed an act of succession which said there had to be a Protestant ruler to get away from the Mary Queen of Scots Catholic, James Catholic, uh, Elizabeth uh, Protestant thing. Uh, Anne had no children, so they got the genealogical chart, went up, went over to her grandfather, went over and down, and found their cousin, Charlotte, who had married the Elector of Hanover, who was a German. The Germany wasn't a country then. But she had just died. So her son, George, becomes George I of England. Um, just, just shortly, because it's a, it's a fun thing. Um, he came over on a boat, landed at the, at the dock, and the English guys were there, this privy consul, and the, and the guys with their wigs and their snuff, and they're you know, looking good. And George I gets off, and he's this dumpy German farmer. He brought his wife over, he brought his mistress over, he literally brought cows over. He looked like a country bumpkin. And he could not speak English, and no one in the English people could speak Hanoverian because German wasn't a language, it hadn't coalesced completely yet. But they found out two guys had church Latin, and they could speak to each other. And interestingly enough, George and Hanover was at war with Sweden. Charles XII of Sweden was fighting all the northern European countries, okay, in which Hanover was one. And George, the dumpy little German farmer, now has a navy. And Hanover's at war with Sweden, and he sends the Navy over to blockade Sweden. And the iron is stopped from coming into the country. Thomas Rutter, a German town blacksmith, realizes that the iron's not coming in. He goes up from Germantown, he goes up to Pine, which becomes Pine Forge. Does everybody know where Pine Forge is? Yeah. No? It, yeah, okay, if you're, if you're in Pottstown, you go up the Manitowney Creek and make a left, and it's right there. Uh, and he starts the iron industry. Uh, 1716, he's making an iron at a bloomery forge, and that was the start of the Pennsylvania iron industry. Now, Pine Forge, interesting enough, was part of the Ole Valley, or at least part of Amity. Um, and what happened in 1740, Thomas Potts, Owen Cole Brookdale, he founded Douglas Township and he pulled Rudder's section, the Pine Forge section, which is the furthest east, into Douglas Township. So where Pine Forge was a part of probably the Ole Valley and it's shown on, on, um, on the map as such, it now is in Douglas Township. So anyhow, that's how iron started in Pennsylvania, uh, 1716. There were four periods of Pennsylvania iron. Okay, the first one was 1716 to 1720. Rudder founds the first forge, Bloomery Forge, a Bloomery Furnace, and a guy down in Coventry named Samuel Nutt founds the second one. 
Okay, 1720 to 1740, okay, they bring in guys to help them run the place. These are managers. Potts and Nut are, are the guys that know how to make it work. But they need two guys to come in and show them how to do a production and distribution system where they produce it, make it work, and go. So third way, and that's when most of the third section is when most of the Oli, Oli was, was done, was 1740 to 760. Rudder, Potts, not owned a monopoly for those early years. Now 1740, you have Lesher coming in, uh, Dietrich Welker, uh, the Grubs over in Cornwall, um, Thomas Mayberry, if you've heard of him, come in, and they're now starting to make iron. So they've lost their monopoly, they're starting to make iron. But all these new guys are still immigrants. 1760 to 1780, their sons are running all the iron industry. These guys are Americans, they've been born in America, they're educated in Philadelphia, and when the revolution comes to a man, they're making cannon, making cannonballs, they're making shells, they're making muskets to use against the British. All right, so that's when it started. That's the four periods, and I'll keep mentioning them. Um, one other thing happened in the 1730s. England starts figuring out that they're making refinished iron over in America. Um, a forge makes, and we'll talk about that, a forge makes finished iron. A furnace makes pig iron. It scared the English manufacturers. I don't know if scared is the right word, but it worried them that America was starting to refine its iron. The English mercantile system of the colonies was, hey colonies, you send us raw materials and we'll do something to you, charge you more and send them back to you. And what these Pennsylvania guys figured out was that they could use the iron in Pennsylvania. They could refine it and sell it in Pennsylvania. They didn't need Britain. Okay, so in 1750, Britain comes out with the Iron Act, which says they start retarding America's ability to refine iron. And again, to a man, when the revolution comes, as a result of that and the other, those guys are helping. Okay, making colonial iron. What is it? It's simple. You take a piece of iron ore rock, and it's about, four, the stuff in Berks County is about 45 to 50 percent iron. Now there's a Mesabi range over in Minnesota, it's about 100 percent iron. But the stuff around here that they were digging is about half iron. So colonial iron production was simply getting the stuff that's attached to the rock, getting rid of it, okay, and melting the iron that's left. Um, and in a forge where they refine that pig iron and make it into wrought iron, it's simply changing the carbon content of the pig iron, making it malleable. Pig iron is not. Um, I have one trouble. I have what things to show in red, and I can't see red at all up here. So, anyhow, well, all right, I, I hope everybody can hear me, I have a pretty good voice. If you look at this area, this is what we're talking about, that's where the iron was in early Pennsylvania. It was southern Berks, northern Chester, and eastern Lancaster counties. And that's where the majority of, that's all, I have, yeah, all right. Yeah, that's yeah all right, that's good, thanks. Uh, that's where the majority of the Pennsylvania iron was, and where the furnaces was. If you, if you have a map and can look at the old, where all the uh, Berks County, Chester County, Lancaster County iron furnaces were, it's an exact showing where the iron is. The iron created the industry, they wouldn't have the industry without the iron. So, colonial iron making. Okay, next slide. All right, the first ironworks that they had in Pennsylvania and since biblical times 
I mean, they, they talk about the iron furnace in the Bible. Uh, was made in bloomeries. Basically, they took iron ore, okay, had a hand bellows, would put charcoal, light the charcoal, pump up and down, take raw iron ore, stick it in there. The problem was it wasn't hot enough to melt it. You needed 2,800 degrees, give or take, to melt iron. And that didn't make it hot enough, but it made it gooey. Like leaving a Hershey bar in your car in the summer. It doesn't melt completely, but it's pretty gooey. I just did that with my grandkids, and they had all over their face. So it, it melts, but it doesn't, doesn't melt all the way. It just gets gooey. And that's what happens in a bloomery. They would then take it out on the angle. They would hit it with a hammer, okay, which starts to change the carbon content. Stick it in water, stick it back in the fire, and keep doing it. And it creates like a white, I've seen it done twice, a white mess in there. They keep adding iron ore, and they have an iron bar that they sort of swirl around. It gets on the end of the iron bar, and they're eventually able to make it into a bar. Okay. Um, rudder creates a bloomery. That's what rudder went in 17... 15, 17, 16, Rudder did a bloomery. Give me the next slide, please, Dan. Here we go. Um, this was from the American um, History Magazine. And this was this guy's, uh, what he thinks that an iron bloomery looked like. If you notice, there's simply a guy sitting there with holding an iron ore in there. There's water down. This was water underneath there. It's a stream. Um, he heats it, he puts it on that anvil, the other guy beats it, they put it back, they keep doing that. Now, there's a, there's a wooden structure around this. This isn't sitting out in the, in the cold. But, but again, all it is is charcoal, iron ore, keep hitting it on the anvil and going. Um, all right. In 1716-ish, there's a guy named Abraham Darby over in England, and he figures out a couple of things. He comes up with a blast furnace. Up until this time, every structure in America and in, the, in, the, in England was a bloomery forge. He comes up with something called a blast furnace. He does something else. He starts using coke instead of charcoal, but that's a different subject. He comes up with a coal blast furnace. Um, and this is the artist's interpretation of that coal blast furnace. Um, there's three guys down below, if you can see them. Two of them are working on the left. One of them's working on the right. Basically, a coal blast furnace had a bridge up top that was into a hill. They built that into the hill, and the hill in this drawing is on the left. Okay, the left was also where they kept all their charcoal, all their iron ore, and all their limestone. The three things that you need to create iron in a blast furnace. Okay, they would, not that one yet, not that one. Uh, okay, they have a water wheel that turns a bellows. Can you see the bellows? Right here. Here are the bellows. And all that water wheel did when it turned was make that bellows go like this. It blew air into it from the bottom. It would bring across here in wheelbarrows, charcoal for fire, iron ore, and limestone. If limestone was a flux, basically because the iron was, was when it melted, was heavy, it would fall to the bottom. The iron ore would, would stay on top and it would collect all the crud that we're trying to get rid of. And the crud comes here. It's siphoned off the top. It's called slag. It was a good article on your website or Facebook or something. Somebody had gone, gone out to uh, Holy Furnace and collected slag. Now the slag is neat. I used to have a good collection of slag. And when we moved, it disappeared. And my wife swears she didn't throw it out. <laughs> I had a little box. This is 
rolling furnace, this is from warming furnace. But the slag is interesting. And sometimes it's green, sometimes it's blue, sometimes it's black, sometimes it has a lot of iron work, all iron in it. And the iron master, who was in charge of all this, that makes it work, would look at the slag and add more something up here. The other thing that's interesting, in the top, which I didn't even know when I, until I saw Warwick, the top of these furnaces was always flat. It's not like this, like you'd see and you would think. It was flat because there was a hole here, and they had to walk across that bridge and dump stuff down here. And they'd do it till it's called being in blast, and they would do it until they ran out of stuff, and then it would go out of blast. Okay, water comes this way. This is the tail race that leads here. This blows bellies. The number of things that they made these, these things go up and down with were amazing. This was simply a trip in a hammer that would lift it up and drop it. Lift it up and drop it. Uh -huh. Both of these are from the National Park Service. And this is, if you look the same thing, we have the slag guy, we have the pig iron. It's said to be pig iron because it looks like suckling pigs. They made iron bars. There's one around in Pottstown from 1740, called Brookdale. And I do think that's what they were like. But they sold the iron by the pound, so they didn't have to be all the same or the same weight. But the difference here is, this is a later model. Notice it's blowing air down here. Okay, they're dumping stuff in here. This was a later model. These are two, they basically were tight barrels. And instead of a a bellows, these things just went up and down and blew water in that way. It was tight fitting in here and it blew it in. I use the term cold blast furnace, okay, because by 1800 they figured out that they can put something over here, catch the heat, and bring it back down, it melts it twice as fast because it's extremely hot up here. Okay, so I, I'll use the term cold blast furnace, but, but by 1800, they had hot blast furnaces. All right, so 2800 degrees, it gets, it melts it. Um, it starts making iron in tons. Bloomer is made iron in pounds. Now we're making it in tons. All right. Um, Slag impurities, iron and tons. Okay, all that gets managed by the iron master. He's the big kahuna. He's the one that makes it all work. You need the ore, but you need some person. Man or woman, there was a woman named Nut, Anna Nut, who ran Warwick in 1737. So it didn't have to be a man, although women were rare. Uh, and she ran it because her husband died. But uh, she was the first colonial iron master in, in probably Pennsylvania, probably the colonies, they don't know. Okay, um, next slide. Here's Ole Furnace. This is 1860. A um, couple of things that are interesting. Back up one time, Tom. This was, this had, this didn't look like this. This had a roof over it. You can see that it's coming. This wasn't out in the, in the open. That was in a what they called the casting house. That was wood. These are the things that we perhaps still see. All this stuff is long gone. Okay, but in the casting house, they did a couple of things. They made pig iron. They also sold, and I just found this recently, and I'm not quite sure what it is. They sold sow. S-O-W, iron, which I think was iron that was in here, because that's a style. I need to look into that a little bit. I was just looking at some old books and found they sold pig and sow iron. But they did one other thing. They made bars, and the furnaces made, Tom, here's the casting house that they made the bars in, that they made Castings in, and I'll show them in a minute. I think that here's the furnace, here's the stack, here's the bridge, 
here's the hill, and this is 1860. I'm not quite sure what this is, uh, unless it's just a, a continuation of the bridge. I don't know. Here would be where they kept the charcoal, which had to be kept under roof. Okay. The iron ore and stuff would come up a wagon, and they dump it here. This is where they would pull the truck. So that's the only furnace in 1860. Um, Okay, here's what remains of those things, and you'll see a couple around. If you go into Warwick Furnace, you're going to see this. Uh, those, are, those are furnace stacks. There used to be built a bridge here. It's gone. There used to be a casting house here. It's gone. There used to be other buildings over here attached to that. That's gone. That's all that's left. That's what I climbed on in 1974. Uh, there were trees growing on it. This is 1930, so it's, it was, if you can imagine, nobody did anything between 1930 and then. A um, couple things. There's not a whole lot of these left, and they're neat to see. They're not because most of these of furnaces, of forges, were sold to farmers. Okay? When they ran out of glass, and they ran out of ore, and when they ran out of wood, they sold them to farmers. If anybody knows any farmers, and I live in an old farm where I live now, and I know lots of them up there, they have lots of things they can do with a good pile of stone. And it doesn't mean you're going to save it. I'm a stone guy. I do stone walls. I do stone buildings. I pay extra to find a stack like this because Somebody's already sorted those stones for me. If you ever go anything, stones don't look like that, particularly the ones that have two angles that you want. So, I mean, they use them, they got rid of them, they, they, they moved them. Sir, okay, here's what it looks like today. Okay, a little different. There's a huge building up here that I didn't get in the picture that was the old charcoal. Thing. But that's what that furnace looks like today. Um, they've done a little bit of work since then to stabilize it. But you can see it's still basically the same thing. It's flat on top. They ran their bridge right here. The hole was right there that they dumped it down. Right in front here again was the casting house where they made pig iron. Look at this. 1776, they cast a cannon at Warwick. That's a word of um, They did it at Oli, they did it at Hopewell, and they did it at uh, uh, Grubsville over in Cornwall. They made cannon for the American Army. Those cannon there were supposed to be for the defense of Philadelphia. They were going to put them on Fort Mifflin uh, to keep the British from sailing out to Delaware. Uh, they didn't get done in time. The British invaded. Pennsylvania in 1777, they buried all those cannons, any they had on hand, and flooded the stream so you couldn't see where the, where the thing. hundred years later, they found the first one. This one was found in 1903. It still sits on the Petersham uh, over at Kaufman, uh, the old Kaufman farm, I guess. The Petersham's owned that? Yeah. All right. So it's still sitting there in the front yard uh, on where they put it in 1903. It's a great story. They found it. The guy was <coughs> two stories. He's, he's digging for trout and digging for eels and digging for frogs. I've heard all three. But he reaches down, he finds a hole, he thinks it's a pipe, he sticks his hand in it and realizes it's a cannon. Uh, Ephraim Kaufman, who owned the property at the time, went over with, uh, I think, eight mules, maybe six. Tried to pull it out, couldn't, had to get some horses. They pulled it, put it back, took it out to his farm, and put it in the front yard, and still there. So, anyhow. But they, so, they cast a variety of things. They turn the page. All right. One of their biggest sellers are stoves. Has anybody seen any stoves or stove plates? These are rare as hen's teeth. That's a six plate stove, but it's a complete stove. These are rare, but there's a bunch of them around. They're just plates. 
And what they did was, in the casting house, they had sand, they had a pattern, which was this card backwards and inside out. They put it on there, they pounded it into the sand, and then they ladled iron on it until it was flat. And it was just, they're, diff they're all different sizes, but they're about a half inch thick. At different heights, different sizes. They would take six of them, put a hole in the top, put a hole in the front, so the air would, so the heat would get out and air would get, and they bolt them together and they had a stove. And this supplemented uh, the uh, iron furnaces uh, for most of the time until the new stoves came in. Tom, you want to do that? Okay. Dietrich Welker. This guy has more name spellings than anybody of any of the iron guys that I met. He has about eight of them. Uh, I don't know. He's obviously German, and somebody was trying to pronounce his name, I think. But that's from Shearwell. That was the furnace before Ole Furnace. Ole Lesher ended up buying the furnace. Um, he and his partner went into bankruptcy, and Lesher ended up with it, changed the name to Ole Furnace. Shearwell was 18, I mean 1757. Um, this is another one he did. It's BS uh, Bernard Swope. What was his name? Swope. Swope. And, and uh, Dietrich Wolfen. Um They're kind of neat. This was a five point, a five plate stove. This is a six plate. Normally they were just boxes. This is kind of interesting. This is an older one. This actually fit into the wall. And it only had five sides. And they would have the stove and the, in between two rooms. They would have the stove between two rooms. And this thing went in. In the one room, you could look right into the back of it, okay? But this went right into the wall, into the thing. The Germans, they said you could tell German houses because the, the chimneys were in the middle of the house. Englishmen stuck them on the outside. Germans in the middle, and they used the fly plate stoves. Um, World War I and World War II, um, metal drives killed them a lot of stoves. Uh, the ones that made it, they were so heavy that nobody moved them. Yeah, they were in the basement, ah, we're just going to leave it down there, we can't move it kind of thing. But they found a lot of these in the back of old chimneys. And they were used as fire backs to reflect heat and to protect the chimney. And then they'd block the chimney up. I just spoke about six months ago now, at, I guess, at Coventry over there, Coventry Park. And a guy brought in a picture. They had just dug one, the Thomas Potts one, out of the, out of the back chimney uh, part of it. So they're rare, they're neat. But a lot of them got saved because they were used as firebacks. But this is called cast iron. We have pig iron, which is the pigs, which gets sent to the refinery, which we'll talk about. And they had cast iron. <coughs> cast iron, um, they made stove plates. They made cartridge boxes, wagon boxes. It fit in the back of a Conestona wagon on the back wheels. And it let the wheels, one wheel go, when they made a turn, one wheel would go faster or the other. It was gears in there, and that's what they used it for. But they also made pots, pans, something called hollowware, and of course can. So they got pretty good at casting stuff. But again, cast iron is very brittle. Doesn't bend. Okay. My grandfather had a cast iron tub in his upstairs. And my cousin and I got to break it up with a sledgehammer. It was great fun when you're eight years old. It's not like a bell. But it broke into pieces. Rod iron doesn't do that. Sir. Okay, two more. This is from a Franklin stove. It's the front plate on a Franklin stove. And it's later than the other ones. The other one, I don't, I'm not sure what that is. I'm probably thinking it's a six point, a six uh, plate stove. Both of them are from Ole Furnace. It may be a 10 plate stove, 
but I don't, I'd have to see it and measure it and look at it and get a better, better feel for it. But the reason I say they're later, could you back up a section? Oh. You just notice how intricate these are? Okay. By the 1780s, 1790s, comics, they were just lumping them out. Okay, you didn't need as much fancy stuff on them. These plates aren't worth as much as the old ones, which used to have biblical sayings on them. Okay, so anyhow, that's uh, Franklin stoves were in existence probably to the 1800s even. They were still making them. Sir. Okay, refinery forge. In, in the books, they're called finery forge or refinery forge. Okay. Abraham Darby discovers a two-part production. Make the pig iron, refine the pig iron. The bloomery did it all at once. This is a make the iron, they send it to the refinery forge that refines the iron and makes it into bar or wrought iron. And wrought iron is what the blacksmiths needed to do everything. It was flexible. The carbon content had changed, and this is what changes it. Okay, there's two pictures I have. This is what you need to look at right here. Um, it was a hammer, and all it did was go up and down. That was all it did. Okay, they had a fire, which they called a furnace. They could add furnaces, they could add two or three fires, they could add two or three hammers, but the reality was, all it did was this. They would take the bar iron, put it in a fire, let it heat, come out, put it under there, and it would hit. And they would shape it <coughs> into wrought iron. They would connect two pieces, and so on. Um, that's simply generally a trip hammer, which again is a piece of wood that just lifts it up and drops, and the next piece of wood lifts it up and drops. The Potts family, in I think it was 1780, dug a hole 20 foot deep here and put a oak tree in it. Down. They then covered it with iron. <coughs> And that's what they would put the iron on and boom. Okay? That thing just contrarily boom, boom, boom. There's a book that I just mentioned to a gentleman here called Six Pennies. It's supposed to be about the Berks County uh, iron industry. You're not sure which one it is. Um, but it's a forge. And the guy, when they're making for 24-7, In the middle of the night, everybody wakes up because there's no noise. So they run over and see what the problem is. Next picture. This is sort of the same thing. Again, it's a building, wooden building, with a trip hammer, with putting the bar iron, I mean the pick iron there, this thing just hits it. It just keeps coming down. That's why I said these guys have to be a little deaf. Okay. These guys are called the hammer man. The guy that runs the furnace is called the iron master. If you've been in the army, it's like the general and the colonel. These guys that would do this with colonels. This is a secondary process. Primary process is the other. Okay. So, um, anyhow, that's how they made refinery iron. Um, okay, forges and furnaces often get lumped together, but let me tell you a little bit about what the differences are. Um, they both work with iron, but they had different functions. Generally, they were owned by the same company. Lesher had a furnace, but he also had a forge. Okay, it wasn't true all the time, and often those two things were sold together. Warwick Furnace and Valley Forge were one thing. Valley Forge was a forge. Okay, and Warwick sent its iron there. Um, they, sometimes you hear the term works. 
French Creek works, the valley works, instead of infringement. It meant that two of these functions were at the same place. And I'm going to talk about it a little bit, but that was rare because there wasn't enough water power to turn both things. The water coming out of the tail race wasn't fast enough and strong enough to, turn, to, to do what it needed to do. There generally was some kind of money man involved in all these furnaces. They had the money. They didn't have the technical expertise. It was like investment capital. Okay, They would invest, but they needed to find somebody to run it. Um, of interest, the Pennsylvania guys figured out very early they didn't need to send to England their iron, that Pennsylvania could use it. Now, they eventually would send their excess iron overseas, but Pennsylvania basically used the iron. Um, Pennsylvania was unique and it had twice as many forges as furnaces. Unlike Virginia, which sent their iron over back to England, Maryland had sent their iron back to England. Pennsylvania had two forges for every furnace. Uh, and that was because they were using the refined iron here. Okay, not overseas, not sent it to England. All right, um, besides, the iron had to be near, the furnace that they discovered had to be near the resource. Forges had to be near a stream, a fast running stream. Looking at Pendleton's map with the five ironworks here at the Ole Valley, I look at it, four of them are forges, and one of them is a furnace. They only had one furnace in the whole Holy Valley. What does that tell you? There wasn't a lot of iron ore here, but there was a lot of fast running streams. And I don't know because you folks out there know more about Holy than I do. I'll bet there was a lot of a lot of grist mills here. Uh, because they had a lot of a lot of iron. Um, the Perky Elman Creek. Looking at that, they had to have a mill or an ironwork every, <laughs> every quarter mile. I don't know, that poor stream was, was blocked everywhere. Anyhow, um, furnaces needed um, a larger labor force. They were more expensive to build. And when you have a labor force, what do you got to do with it when you're out in the boonies? Feed them, house them, give them lots of liquor. They, I'm serious, I, I'm amazed at the amount of liquor these guys bought. They must have been snuckered the entire time they were working. Um, but anyhow, let's see, uh, next slide. All right, this is Oldie Forge. Again, this now would be all gone because it's all wood, okay? That's wood, that's wood, that's wood. And somewhere, the water wheel, turns that, and that hammer was probably going this way. This is 1860, okay. Head race, tail race, water comes out. Um, there's a bunch of, not a bunch, 10 or so uh, ruins of furnaces. There's no forges around. In the Pennsylvania archives, they have what they said was the Hay Creek Forge which is simply a long, it's a, it's a 30 foot log, for the lack of a better word, with, a, with, a, with, a, with a, something metal on the front of it. But, is that mine turned it on? Yeah, yes. Oh, okay. <laughs> uh, anyhow, um, there was often a grist mill or a sawmill on the race. The iron masters or the hammer guy uh, would add a grist mill, a small country mill, not a big merchant mill, or a sawmill, which simply was up and down, they were pit saws, and they would put them on the tail race. The, uh, the industry was always, the, uh, the buildings were always further down toward the end of the race, so they were catching all the power. Next one. Okay, water. What's wrong with using water as a power source? It could dry up. Freeze. Freeze. Yep. So they did a couple things to help that a little bit. And the dry up thing, they needed a fast 
fast flowing stream. Has everybody seen a, a, a water, you know, a water wheel? The water comes down and it pushes that wheel up, fills it with water, and then it dumps and does it again. But you need a fairly fast flowing stream. How do you increase the speed of water? A pipe? A dam. A dam. Oh, a dam. That's correct. First one is a dam. You put a big body of water and a little opening and a sluice, and the water rushes out. Or you can do it downhill. That makes water run faster. Water was very important. Now this was, I pulled this off a, a map. This is an 1870 surveyor's map of water furnace. And I did it simply because it shows what a race is. Here's the race coming in, goes through the furnace, and comes back out. There was a dam here, I would imagine. They didn't show it. But something was here to back the water up that they could lift up and shift the water here and have it come back in the stream here. Um, races were important for grist mills. What I found, you know, interesting also, a, a lot of hammermen became grist mill owners, or grist mill owners became hammermen, which was different than the, the knowledge you needed for, to run a furnace. Uh, that was just different. It was sort of that you basically were dealing with a water wheel that, that, that moved things. Sir. All right. I was just sent this by Tom. I had never seen it. It's done by a guy named George Schultz in 36. He um, did a lot of representations of, of things. He would draw what he thought they looked like. This is the Rockland Forges. It was owned by uh, Andre, Colonel General Andre. Um, I was trying to figure it out. There's two forges. There's a forge here with two water wheels, which I've never seen. One water here for the, for the forge. So this had two forges. So it's Rockland Forges. Okay, and it comes, the, the water comes down here, goes into a race, comes into a sluice, comes this way, comes over here, head race, tail race is here somewhere. I mean, it's Old Forge Dam, 1781. I don't know where we got that, but that's, well, something has to be there to let the water through and to shut the water off, whatever that is. Um, anyhow, that's just the interesting forges. They were, in this case, two forges on the property. Birdsboro always had more than one forge on his property. William Bird uh, had more than one forge. Okay, one more. All right. Or, iron ore is neat. I took this picture. I told you I'm a rock guy. I built a house around an old well that I found on the property. The 1830 house had a well on it, so I built that around. And people always say, how did they know where the ore was? When you go out, you're looking for ore. How do you know it's here? And how do you know it's going to last? We have iron ore on the property. We have a farm. We have iron ore on the property. I see it around. I didn't know enough about it when I moved up there. Look at this. That's rust. You've seen churches, old buildings with that coming down. There's iron in that rock. Okay, and unfortunately, that's right in the middle where I put it. That was a nice rock. But you can tell where there's iron. There's a field that we have that water comes off a hill. And in one place, it is totally brown, rust-colored. There's iron right there. If I was looking for iron, that's where I'd be digging. But my people like Warwick, the iron lasted 150 years. They were still digging it. The Jones mines down there, the, the, the Warwick mines, the Boyertown mines. An interesting thing about ore was that as they developed new technology, old mines became active again. Okay, What they would do, they had a grate, they would make a grate, they would take these rocks and pound them through the grate, so the iron ore was always about the same size. 
Okay, and that's what they were wheeling over in carts and dumping in the top of the furnace. Um, iron ore um, in Warwick, the Warwick mines, which are right, they run into Berks County, the southeastern is part of Berks County. Um, they dug down, and they were pits. They, were, they weren't, Boyertown sort of had the first deep mines that we know around here. Then other ones, Jones Mine came up where we had one. But, but Boyertown was sort of the first ones to go really deeper than that. But they were pit mining. The iron ore over there was two feet from the surface. And it was two, two feet deep. And it was six acres. So two guys early on could do enough iron ore to keep a furnace going. Okay, so they dig a hole, get the iron out. That's gone now. Go over here, dig another hole. What are we going to do with the stuff? Let's put it in this hole. <laughs> okay, they get all done. Somebody enterprising guy like Tom, at the end of it, digs five feet. Holy crap, another, another iron thing. Let's dig down there. So now they have all these holes filled back up. So they're doing it again. It was very inefficient. It was, I'll dig over here, you dig over here. It wasn't until the 1850s, an engineer came in, he plotted it out and said, we're going to scrape everything off and start, start fresh. But we got two complaints, not complaints, laughs from two German, one was a Swiss guy, uh, Swedish guy, one was a German Hessian that said, these guys don't know a thing about iron digging. <laughs> Mining. They went out with iron with some vacant bars and thought they were miners. Okay, they weren't. But the miners had to do one other thing. What's wrong with filling, digging holes? They fill up with water. When I was a kid, we had a quarry we used to swim because it didn't didn't let any water out. Okay, so you always had one guy had a pump, hand pump. Okay, pump the water out and then dig it. So it wasn't easy. Um, furnaces had more labor. They originally called them iron plantations, and they found out that that was wrong. That they got a lot of labor from off from farmers in the off season. Would end up as miners and stuff. The farmers around here. Um, remember, I told you they clear cut. Farmers would buy that land. They didn't replant trees on it. They sold it to farmers because now there's no trees on it. Okay, and the farmers on the off season would work for the iron masters. All right, one more, sir. All right, labor. Always, 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 it was tough to get people to come up here and work in the mines. Okay, they did a couple things. They used indentured servants, and they were always running away. And these articles gave me a whole lot of information on who was running the furnace or the forge at that time. Okay, how big, whatever. I mean, I pulled a lot of information from runaways. But they used indentured servants, and they started using African slaves. When the revolution, when was the, 1780 was the Gradual Emancipation Act in Pennsylvania. The folks that had the most slaves were iron masters. Okay, so they did use African labor. Uh, not as much, certainly, as the South, uh, but we did use African labor. Uh, when you use an indentured servant, and they're there for three years, okay, and they're, you've trained them, and their three years is up, what, what do you have? A training problem, because your guy just left. You're continually having to train. With, with slaves, you didn't have to do that. All right, um, one more. Okay, can we have the lights? Thank you. Um, does everybody have their handouts? Because this is the exciting thing for me. Yeah, I'm sorry, thank you. I I put my here. I came down this morning, today, coming from the, uh, the, the east, the west, that I normally don't come this when I stopped today, they got um, about phone, and then I'm off after. Uh, phone ring. 
I stopped at a diner. I go in, I'm sitting, there's a counter, and there's a guy sitting on the edge of the counter that's about our age, all of us here. <laughs> and a phone starts ringing. And everybody starts looking around. We're in the seats, and everybody look around. And the waitress yells, John, your phone's ringing. He said, it is? Who would call me? So now the whole diner's involved in this, they're laughing. And the waitress says, I don't know who called you, just turn your phone off. So he picks it up and looks at it. Says, hello? What? 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 Hands up. So he puts it down. She said, what did they want? I don't know. I couldn't hear him. <laughs> that was my All right. What I'm going to try to get us to do is to build a furnace. This is to try to see what, you know, what we would need to do if we were sitting in Philadelphia after a Quaker meeting or in a tavern. I guess it depends on, I don't know if Quakers drank. I guess they didn't, so we better say after. Meeting. Quakers in Philadelphia were merchants. They had money. There were two ways to make money in colonial Philadelphia. Merchants and selling land. But now, Thomas Rudder comes up to Amity and opens a forge and starts selling iron. And we start hearing things about it. And we say, hey, that's a pretty, sounds like something we want to invest in. So we're going to form a company, a share company, and we're going to open an iron furnace in Poland. Okay? I want you to think about what we're going to need to do. What do we need to do? The first thing I'll tell you that they do is we all sign an agreement and it gets filed as a, as a deed like so saying we're going to create a company. And there, let's say there are 100 of us, everybody owns one share, there's 100 shares. And this lady has, I went out, she sells her share over here, so now she has a share. And it gets so confusing, the early stuff, you try to track it, it's crazy, trying to track, they own one twelfth of one half, of one half. I mean, it gets money. Okay, but anyhow, we're not going to do that, because we're all young, we're involved in the company. What do we need to do? Buy land, there's a man. Buy land. We need land. What kind of land do we need? Just Near wall, uh, wall okay. <laughs> it has to be something that, 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 that we know is going to work. So we buy land. Most of the land that the Iron Masters bought in Oli, in Warwick, and whatever, were bought from the Pan government by something called a warrant. They would go, they would say, I want 200 acres up in Oli. And I want it near the Manitani Creek. And they would look, they'd send somebody out and they'd do it. So number one, we have land. If you have a pencil, please write land down. That's a good one. That was my first one. All right. But we need, no, I'm going to back off. We need something before that. What do we need? Money. money. <laughs> we need capital. So we all have to chip in money first. And that's where we come in. We all give a dollar or whatever it is, and we get our share. So we collect money, probably from Quakers, because the Quakers were totally involved in the iron industry in Pennsylvania up through 1860, 1870. They ran it. You had the guys on the ground, but they supported it. They were the money people. Okay, so we have capital that we just all collected, and we just bought land. What else do we need? The resources. Resources, raw materials. What are they for a furnace? Limestone. Limestone. The, the, mine, the miners also dug the limestone. I forgot to mention that. Wood. Do we have to worry about wood? What, where we're sitting right now in 1730, where do you think we're sitting? In yeah. trees. Forest. Okay, so almost any place you're going to look at trees. Iron ore, good one. Those are our three resources that we need. We need land that has iron ore. We need land, trees we're not worried about. We need land that has limestone. And we don't worry about limestone because this is a limestone area. Okay. But what else does that land need? Water. 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 A stream. A fast flowing stream that has 
something that we can build. Now, what they used to do is, just pretend I'm drawing something here. If the stream went like this, this would be an extremely good place to put a race. You see what I'm doing? If the stream had a bend in it, put the, put the dam here, come across here. Okay, so it went back here. Okay, so we now have water. We now have a place that we found a good ore. Who do you think found it? Did we find it? The Iron Master. We needed to hire a guy that knew what he was doing. He's the big kahuna. He's the one with all that makes it all work. So we hired, who did we hire? Tom. Okay. We sent Tom out. Tom found us a place. In fact, we didn't buy land yet. We went out and looked around first before we bought the land, right? So we knew what land we could buy. We filed with the, with the Penn government. We got the land and we got going. Okay, anything else we need? What? Workers. <laughs> Workers. Laborers. Laborers. Do they grow on trees? How many people out here in 1730 were willing to work in a... There weren't anybody up here. We had to get them off the boat at Philadelphia. Dentured servants. They were good for three years. Germans and mostly Northern Irelanders. They say Islanders, but they weren't Southern Ireland. They were Northern Islanders from Northern Ireland, and they were Germans. And we have a couple really good things of telling how much it costs to bring them over, how much, whatever. So we now have labor. We now bring them up. Now what? Housing. Huh? Housing. 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 Thank you. We have, we're all sitting around the cold. It's raining on us. Now we got to build houses. Holy cow, they're giving him some money. Okay, it's not cheap anymore. I've seen refinery forges with two workers. Now we're up to a whole lot more. We have guys that are looking, they have to cut the wood. They have to dig the, dig the ore. They have to dig the race. The race is not come free if you got to dig a race. Always, 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 the iron ropes were short of labor. Okay, always. All right, what else? Two more things that I can remember. Transportation. Thank you. You have my sheet? No, I'm not. That's good. We, okay, we can, we can do, we can make a million pounds of iron up here. And it can be a big pile. Where does it have to go to sell it? Philadelphia, because Philadelphia is where the market is. So we have to have somewhere to get it to Philadelphia. But what do we need to do that? Roads. Canal. Canals never worked. Up here they didn't. Because the Schuylkill River up to 1800 was not navigable, except for maybe three months of the year. Okay? The Potts family, the Berg family, the Grubb family spent hundreds of pounds buying black powder and blowing rocks out of the middle of the stream, and it just never worked. So canals didn't work. Good idea. They eventually did, but not here, not at all. So who said roads? Were there any roads up here? You went to the Penn government and said, we need a road from X to Y. And they sent you to uh, the judge, judges that handled that, and they would determine. But, you know, there's a group over here that also has a forge and a furnace, and they want a road built. So now we're into politics. We want our road built. We don't care about their road. So we had to build a road, and often, the early iron masters were the ones that built the road. Okay, the turnpike. Now, interestingly enough, they had road supervisors fairly early. They never figured out who was going to repair the roads. They had a system to build them, but not to repair them. Sort of like today a little bit. <laughs> okay, one other thing, and you almost hit it. And now, <clears throat> market. We needed somewhere at the market. So, sell it. So we just produced, okay, 
a furnace. We just discovered and we just came up with a production and distribution system. And that's what brought the iron bay into, into Philadelphia. Okay, quickly. Um, I'm going to really go over fairly quickly. You have a handout that shows the five forges and furnaces in the Oley Valley. Okay? These are the ones up here. These are the ones you can go over and find some slag at. Uh, Burns forges are kind of interesting. He built one on uh, Hay Creek. He built another one. He built another one. The third one morphs into Bird's Burrow itself and makes iron for a long time. A lot of changes in ownership, but, but it was an early one in Baden. Oli Forge. The thing I find interesting about Oli Forge, they called it the German Forge. And I didn't know what that means, and I'm still not completely sure. Lescher was a German. Dietrich and all those guys were Germans. But the best thing I could do, I found in 1860, it says they used the Swedes method to produce iron. And I don't know what the Swedes method is. Oli Furnace, it was built on something called Shearwell Furnace. And the plates we had up here from Dietrich Walker were the plates before that. He went bankrupt. There's a tremendous number of these guys who go bankrupt. And I found a lot of stuff looking in bankrupt papers. Pine Forge. If you get a chance, you should try to go to Pine Forge. It's neat. It has the 1830, 1730 mansion still there. It was on the edge of Olwe. It got moved to Douglas Township. But it was the first forge in Pennsylvania, the first ironwork. And the old 1730 mansion, the center part of the mansion is still there. And it's fun to look at. It's an easy drive over. Spring Forge. Spring Forge is in Earl Township. I just passed it, actually, when I went into where it's on the beach. Um, Spring Forge was important because it was the first attempt to do multi-forge, multi-furnace movement. Thomas Good, Thomas Potts, owned Cole Brookdale and Pine Forge. He built Mount Pleasant, okay, and Spring Forge, so he now had four. And what they did, they eventually ended up, you know, U.S. Steel went two, four, six, eight, ten. That was the first time. So in Oley Valley, you have the first forge, first ironwork, and the first attempt at providing uh, multi-forge, multi-furnace. Any questions? Is it hot? Hot? No. <laughs> all right. I got a question. Okay. Yes. Um. So, like all the dye bays boulders all over the ridges surrounding here like <clears throat> did they just kind of roll them down the hills and crush them and you know head them head them down to the furnaces you mean the iron ore uh -huh. um, it depends on which place they were digging obviously um, they had they they would put them in it was up to the the interesting thing on the iron ore was it was called mine like, instead of war, they called it mine. Four wheelbarrows of mine. Okay? They dug it wherever they could, but they had to get it up on the hill so they could put it into the furnace. But around here, aren't the hills just covered with diabase? I'm not sure of the word that you're using. It, it, it's iron ore bearing boulders. Like, like so it's really heavy. Probably. I don't know. Is it enough to support a furnace? Well, there's the Oli furnace right down here. I don't, you know, I don't know enough of where the Oli got their got their um, um, ore from. I, I'm I think right here on these hills. Okay. Well, I have been farm that has a hole in it, and I know they got iron ore. Iron ore out of that. The iron ore is here. The iron ore is here. The, iron ore is here. the question is, was there enough iron ore there to keep a furnace running for four years? Yeah. Or was it a better over here where they're, you know, whatever? All right, hey, thank you. It's been long. It's, uh, it's been awesome.